I'm really looking forward to seeing the comments on this one. I think people will be having some really interesting historical discussions about King Alfred and the unification of 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 Eng England. Okay. So last time I talked about the unification of the English kingdom in this video. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out because this one is sort of a, a, a kind of part two to that. And I talked about the term unification and how it's often applied to this period, but some of the issues with that. And then I said, don't worry, this video is a bit technical. Next week, I'll be talking about Alfred the Great and how he fought the Danes. Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about before Alfred because that's just what I'm like. This is what England looked like sort of when Alfred came to the throne. Um, actually, this is before Alfred came to the throne because the Viking great heathen army hasn't really happened yet. But in this video, I wanted to look at why was England this shape before Alfred? And essentially, it's going to be a history of Wessex in the early 9th century to look at the exploits of his grandfather and his father. Now, his grandfather was a man called Edgbert and his father was a man called Ethelwulf. And both of these kings were very important for the development of Wessex and definitely would have been very different if they hadn't have been king and if things had gone differently. So first, I'm going to take a look at King Edgbert, who was born around 771, 775. Uh, the sources are a bit unclear, and he ruled until 839. So his father was a man called Aelmund, and Aelmund was actually a king of Kent, not a king of Wessex. But he was driven out by the Mercians, who were the kingdom that sort of sat in the middle of England, had control of large swathes of the Midlands. They had grown especially powerful in the previous century under King Offa towards the second half of the 8th century. And the situation in England at this time was known as the Mercian Supremacy because they were the supreme Anglo-Saxon power. But in 802, the uh, Aelstan had taken refuge in Wessex. His son then came to the throne of Wessex, and this is Edgbet. And already the day that he assumed the throne, the Mercians tried to thwart this ascension. They were constantly meddling in other kingdoms' politics. And they sent, or we assume it was the Mercians. There is a sub-kingdom or a tribe, depending on what you want to call them, called the Huica, who lived just north of the border with Wessex. And they invaded on the day of his ascension under an elderman called Ethelmund. But they were defeated by a West Saxon elderman, Weostan, who fought them and died there. So Edgbert was able to take the throne of Wessex. But this wouldn't be the last clash between Wessex and Mercia, because in 825, King Edgbert and the Mercian king Beowulf fought at a very significant battle called the Battle of Ellendon. And during this battle, the West Saxons were victorious. And this is often seen as the final sort of death knell, the, the final nail in the coffin of the Mercian supremacy. Because at this point, the supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms flips and Wessex seems to become more powerful than Wessex in many regards. As we read in one of the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, then he sent his son Ethelwulf from the army and Aelstan, his bishop, and Wulfhaird, his elderman, to Kent with a great troop. Now, big shout out to May, who's probably watching this video because at this point Kent is then the king Baldred is driven north of the Thames and Kent becomes part of the West Saxon kingdom to the south as we can see. So that's how Wessex takes all the land south of the river Thames. In 829, so four years after the pivotal battle, Edgbert even feels strong enough to invade Mercia itself and drives its king Wiglaf into exile. But this state of affairs doesn't last particularly long. Despite the West Saxon strength, they aren't able to hold on to this position and so Mercia retains its independence. Although a lot of the battles they fight are in a, in a kind of cold war with exerting influence on the other kingdoms. So Wessex had subsumed Kent, it had subsumed Sussex and Essex, and now they were fighting over influence in East Anglia. And the Mercians at several times tried to invade East Anglia, and actually two of their kings were killed fighting against the East Anglians, and no doubt the West Saxons were helping the East Anglians against the Mercians in this kind of way. Now what's interesting as well is the monetary history in the period. We don't have too many sources, and the written sources we do have are almost all from after this period and written with a West Saxon bias. But if we look at numismatic evidence, we see some very interesting things. And one of these things that we see is that they start minting coins in London. London came under West Saxon control. It had been under Kentish control for a long time. The Mercians had come in, but now the West Saxons were in control. There was an important mint there. And we see coins being minted there 
calling Edgebert the King of Mercia, probably referring to this date either after the Battle of Elendon, where he had defeated the Mercians, or perhaps in 829 when they invaded Mercia and were briefly actually in control of Mercia. We also see coins being minted in Canterbury, which again was another important minting place in Kent. So it's showing West Saxon control over Kent because they're now minting their own coins in what had formerly been a different kingdom. Nevertheless, we shouldn't see this process teleologically, as I said several times in the last video. This isn't these kings trying to create England. They're not thinking, oh, we'll take this and we'll take this and then we'll have completed the jigsaw that's England. They're just trying to expand their own power and expand their own influence. And as we'll see in the case of Kent, they definitely thought of this area as a separate entity to Wessex for quite a number of years. They didn't think this was one piece of a jigsaw that had been waiting to be connected the entire time, as we sometimes do. Oh, and I've horrifically spelt teleologically there. Apologies for the, the error there. Um, now, what we see in one of the charters of King Edgebet is that they are called the kings of the West Saxons and also of the people of Kent. So what I'm saying there is that they, they see Kent as a separate bit that they are now in control of, and that's why they mention it separately. Now, those of you who are more perceptive will notice that it says kings, which is plural. And that's because we also now need to talk about the son of King Edgebert, King Ethelwolf, or at this time he'll still be an Etheling, so Prince Ethelwolf. Because in 838, we get a very interesting charter. I believe it's S1438 is the, uh, the number that it's given. And in this charter, it's essentially an agreement between the king, King Edgebert, uh, as well as his son, King Ethelwolf, with two of the most important uh, members of the clergy, in the in Wessex at the time. So one is the Bishop of Winchester, which is the sort of the capital of Wessex, if you will. It's where all the important things happen in Wessex. Important uh, churches are there, for example, and it's an Episcopal see, all of this, but also with the Bishop of London, which is that area that had recently been taken over. So it's showing that they're exerting influence in this new area that they'd captured, but perhaps also it shows that they need the support of the people of Kent, that this was that it had enough uh, autonomy that perhaps on the death of King Edgebert, the agreement made was that they would support the succession of his son, King Ethelwolf. So again, it, it's showing to the kingdom that Ethelwolf is his chosen successor because it, it wasn't primogeniture during this time. It wasn't that the uh, oldest son would naturally inherit everything, that there was much debate. The Witan had to decide on uh, who would become king after the last king died and all of this. But this is essentially an agreement saying that the, the strongest uh, members of the clergy, the most powerful members of the clergy within this new kingdom of Wessex, with Kent added on, were agreeing to his ascension. And it's important that there are clerical figures from Kent being added to that list. Now, we need to talk about King Ethelwolf, who is Alfred's father and the son of King Edgebert. And he ruled from 839, which is when King Edgebert died, until his own death in 858. Now, already under the reign of King Edgebert, there had been mounting Viking raids. And these raids weren't just hit and run in ships, but more frequently they became these big events with large Viking armies that would travel around and attack centers inland. But actually, King Edgebert was really quite successful at fighting the Danes. He'd lost a few battles, but from the, the records in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, we see that actually he won quite a few more, and Ethelwolf also has a really good track record against the Vikings, unlike what you'll see in the show Vikings, which is a great shame, actually. Now, Ethelwolf had a lot of sons, but actually, at the moment, I want to talk about his one daughter that he had. He might have had more that we don't know about, but his daughter was called Ethelswith, and she's important because in 853, she married the Mercian king, King Burgred, and this led to closer cooperation between the kingdoms of Wessex and Mercia, so away from the hostility that had been the situation under his father, Edgebert, and towards a closer cooperation. Now, I've mentioned coinage before, and actually something very interesting happens under King Ethelwolf's reign that kind of demonstrates the relationship between Wessex and Mercia. And this is that they start up what's often referred to as a joint coinage. And I'd like to read for, for you now from uh, King's Currency and Alliances, a history and coinage of Southern England in the 9th century, written by uh, Mark Blackburn and David Dumville, two very prominent historians and numismatists, about this relationship that they had. But it still remains difficult to imagine the economic or political significance of such a joint coinage at the time. 
On a simple level, it may possibly have been felt to express English solidarity in the face of the Danes. Ethelwolf could also conceivably have contemplated some advantage in fostering the revival of London as a mint and centre. Bearing in mind its position as the old capital of the Roman province in England's principal port, already potentially the English capital. The Londonia issue of circa 829, on which Ethelwolf's father termed himself Rex M, King of the Mercians, hints at the importance which Edgebert attached to the city, as well as showing his awareness of the potential of coinage as an instrument of propaganda. Later, Asa carefully insists on London's non-Mercian East Saxon status in his life of Ethelwolf's son. A maximalist interpretation of Ethelwolf's design in facilitating this issue might see an attempt on his part to engineer a limited monetary union and thereby begin to incorporate London into the larger money economy of Kent and Wessex. Clearly, Mercia would be a subordinate partner in such a development. The West Saxon coinages continued uninterrupted at Rochester and Canterbury, while only the Mercian coinage at the time was this Rochester-London issue shared with Wessex. So this is a, a very telling thing about the relationship between Wessex and Mercia. Now, it's another of Ethelwolf's children. Uh, you might have heard of him, first name Alfred, surname De Groot. That's just a joke for the Dutch people in, in the world. Never mind. But he also married a Mercian. He married a uh, so another princess of the Mercian royal family called Aylesworth. And this further strengthens the bond between the two. Now, in 853, uh, this is the same year that Burgred married Ethelsworth, so Alfred's sister. I know the names can get very confusing. This is also the year in which the West Saxons militarily support the Mercians to subjugate the Welsh. So I think the key word to describe this relationship between Wessex and Mercia would, would be cooperation. Again, it's not looking at, they're not forming a joint kingdom, they're not starting to relinquish their own independence. Clearly Wessex has a bit of the upper hand, as we can see from the relationship with the coinage. But really, Mercia is, is on, still independent, it's on its own foot, but they're helping each other out economically with the coinage and militarily, as we'll see with several instances with Alfred's brothers, and also under Alfred's reign, and under the reigns of his successors. Now, as well, we want to look at King Ethelstan, because that also adds an interesting dynamic to what was happening in Wessex at the time. Now, this was actually Ethelwolf's oldest son, Athelstan, and we read in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, and one of the uh, recessions therefrom, we read, He gave to his son Athelstan the kingdom of the people of Kent, and the kingdom of the East Saxons, and of the people of Surrey, and of the South Saxons. So again, it's interesting to see that there is still clearly this distinction. Obviously, these had all been independent kingdoms not too long ago. And so there is a division between the kingdom, where you've got the core heartland of Wessex being ruled over by Ethelwolf, and then uh, the other these other kingdoms more towards the east that are being ruled by Ethelstan. Now in 855, actually King Ethelwolf goes on pilgrimage to Rome. He'd already sent his younger son Alfred to pilgrimage on Rome some years before, but he clearly felt strong enough in his position to leave the kingdom behind under the control of his two eldest children at the time, Ethelbert and Ethelbald. Ethelstan had probably already died at this point. Um, and he goes away on pilgrimage and divides the kingdom with a the western side going to King Ethelbert and the eastern side going to King Ethelbald. And clearly this was something that was very normal to the West Saxons. Uh, King Edgebert had done it, he'd given part of his kingdom to King Ethelbald, the Kentish side. And now King Ethelwolf was doing it again, he'd already done it with King Ethelstan. And then when he died, he now split the kingdom between his two sons when he went on pilgrimage. So splitting the kingdom was something really normal at this point. And again, it means we should be cautious about thinking about a unification process. Now this seems to have come particularly to a head when Ethelwolf returned from pilgrimage. Now on the way back he stopped at the court of, I think it will have been Louis the Peaceful, my Frankish emperors escaped me, and he actually married his daughter, so the granddaughter of Charlemagne. Her name was Judith and she will turn out to be a very important figure later on as well. And I think on his way back Ethelbald kind of understood that his father was going to split the kingdom and this is something he wanted to avoid. So when Ethelwolf returned to England, he found Ethelbald in open rebellion against him. He refused to relinquish, let's say, his half of the kingdom. He had some powerful allies as well, the Bishop of Sherburn, an important centre in uh, his part of, of Wessex that he was ruling over. 
as well as the Elderman of Somerset. And so there was almost a civil war between the two, but eventually they decided to split the kingdom. So Ethelwolf ruled in the west while Ethelbald continued to rule in the east, or that's at least what we can understand from Asa's charters. That's until 858 when King Ethelwolf dies, and at this time the kingdom is split again between Ethelbald and his brother Ethelbert. And actually, they get on really quite well. There is no mention of hostility or fighting, even though we get a really bad rap for Ethelbald from the sources in the Chronicles, especially Asa later on. As Michael John Key writes in Edward the Elder, King of the Anglo-Saxons, the forgotten son of Alfred, a civil war in Wessex between father and son was barely averted, and a form of joint rule was initiated with each seemingly controlling separate parts of the kingdom until Ethelwald's death on the 13th of January 858. The marriage to Judith had implications for Ethelwolf beyond any conflict with his immediate family, and the church may also have not been fully supportive of this fait accompli. This provision that saw the Kingdom of Wessex divided between father and son may therefore have had some input from Canterbury that has been neglected by chroniclers. Ethelbald's reputation has fared badly from these events, but perhaps he should be given some benefit of the doubt in this matter. So I want to finish this video here because I think there's quite a lot to digest there. It's a complex period before Al Alfred's brothers come to the throne um, with Edgebert and with Ethelwolf and the various divisions between the kingdom. But there are a few takeaway points that I want to reiterate before I finish off. So first, the actions of Alfred's grandfather and father helped assert Wessex as the most powerful of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms by the arrival of the Great Heathen Army. So the Great Heathen Army would arrive in England in 865, and the situation they found in England was, a lot of it was down to the actions of Edgebert and Ethelwolf in creating this, especially the situation in Wessex, where all of the land south of the River Thames, apart from Cornwall, which was an independent British kingdom was under the control of the West Saxons and I think this is one of the reasons they're able to resist quite strongly against this invading army. Secondly also by the reign of Alfred's brothers there is cooperation between Wessex and Mercia you've got the coinage cooperation as well as military cooperation between the two we already saw that West Saxon troops helped the Mercians in Wales and when the Danes were arriving uh, King Burgred called upon the alliance of course he was married to Ethelswith to the daughter of King Ethelwolf Alfred would also marry a Mercian Aylesworth so there's strong connections between the two and so they were able to jointly resist the Danes Although it did much good to the Mercians, it didn't really help them out in the end. But I think it gave the West Saxons some time, which it was really crucial and really helped them to remain as one of the last bastions of Anglo-Saxon rule in England. And eventually to bounce back and to start to take territory from the Danes again. Another point I want to make is that we should still avoid looking at this teleologically, as I've reiterated a few times in this video. Edgebert and Ethelwolf were doing what every other ruler was doing at their time. They were trying to expand their power and their influence to gain wealth, uh, to gain more territory, to rule over, just as all the kings were at the time. They're not trying to, to sort of reunite the pieces of the jigsaw and make England. And finally, always cover up when reading on camera because apparently my comment section is very thirsty but i still really appreciate all of you so thank you very much for watching this has been my video on king ethelwolf and king edgebet the father and grandfather of king alfred the great and next time i should be talking about actually about king alfred and his defense against the danes uh, when he became king so i hope you've enjoyed this one this is kind of the it's uh, going back a bit before Alfred again, but I think it's important to lay out what was happening before that time because then things during his reign make more sense. So there is more of a move towards cooperation with the Mercians uh, and as well with asserting dominance over the kingdoms in Kent and Essex and Sussex. But at the same time, they're not or they don't already have these ambitions to sort of take on all of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. That sort of I think it's something that they kind of forge along the way that. Alfred was thinking in terms of defense. I've been reading a book about King Edward the Elder, who is much neglected in our history, and it's a great shame. I think he's the one who really takes it and goes, actually, we could quite possibly take a lot of this land and make it all West Saxon. And then I think it's under King Ethelstan that he kind of goes, you know, we could take most of the area where there are Anglo Saxons speaking English and we could call that England. So I think 
that's kind of where I'm going with this series, but I'm going to keep reading, keep doing my research, and hope that you keep watching and enjoying it. So thank you very much. I have been Hilbert, and this has been The History. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Give me a subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Don't forget to have a great day.